Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel and to another video from our recent trip to Leicestershire. This week we get to explore a ruined 15th century military gothic castle. We climb the steep stairs of Lord Hastings Tower and we discover the life for the rich and famous that lived and dined at this incredible castle. So join us as we walk the remains of Ashby de la Zouche Castle. After the Norman Conquest, the estates here at Ashby or Ashibi as it's known and called in the Doomsday Book, was owned by the Earls of Leicester. There wasn't a castle here at the time, just an unassuming fortified manor house that we have the luxury of exploring in today's video. Sometime in the late 12th century, the estate at Ashby was granted to the Lazouche family in exchange for military services to the Earls. There is very much little known about the Zouche family manor, which historians expect would have stood where the castle's great hall is now. The Zouche line died out in 1399, and there were major disputes that went on and on right up until 1462, when William, Lord Hastings, was granted possession, along with the other massive estates elsewhere in the Midlands. The powerful politician himself was an English nobleman who became a close friend of King Edward VI. William served as Edward's Lord Chamberlain, whose role was to be the most senior officer of the royal household. The Chamberlain would supervise the various departments and he also acted as the main channel of communication to the King. At the time of Edward's death, William became one of the most powerful and richest men in England. He was executed following accusations of treason by Edward's brother and successor, Richard III, although his execution and his death is very controversial. The more traditional justification is that Richard was eagerly trying to gain control of the throne for himself, and taking William out of the picture would have been the easiest move. Either way, the death of him was classed as brutal, not for the physical violence part, but more for the fact that there were no charges, no real trial, and no convictions, especially considering William's long and undoubtedly long service. Lord Hastings was buried in the North Isle of St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. The original family manor house of the Zouches was later converted into a castle by William. He had acquired many properties across the Midlands during the wars and many of them were confiscated from his enemies. Amongst these was the manor of Ashby de la Zouche, which was given to William in 1462. A few years later, after his father maintained the family seat at nearby Kirby Muxlow, Lord Hastings decided to use Ashby as his main residence. In 1474, Edward granted William the right to crenellate, meaning giving permission to fortify and fix up the property. And so he did, along with another three more of his manors, and he built deer parks around them. He had set about to develop an old complex at Ashby, with new fortified and impressive buildings and he was authorised to design and create a massive 3,000 acre park around the site. His intentions were to construct a significant castle, similar to semi-nearby Nottingham Castle, with four massive towers. That being said, work on the site started a year before William was actually given permission, with the construction of the castle's chapel. But it appeared that William fancied a gamble, and knew that the king would more than likely approve it anyway. After William's execution, the castle was passed to William's son, Edward Hastings, who had appeared to have spent very little time at the property, but he did manage to host an important visit from Henry VIII in 1503. The 
kitchen tower stands on the northwest corner of the castle. It was always built and intended to supply and serve Lord Hastings' huge household of people. The tower had only two stories, as when you look around you can see on the ground floor of the kitchen, the walls were amazingly high at almost 10 metres up. The kitchen was well lit and had several hearths and a large oven for cooking. It also included a well and a sizeable cellar for storage. Just above the kitchen there was a large room. This was known as the winter parlour. Amazingly, an underground passage was made, more than likely dating from the Civil War, which links the Great Tower with the kitchen tower. It was after inherited by his son, George Hastings, who was a favourite and friend of Henry and was made the Earl of Huntington in 1529, which meant he was able to oversee and rebuild parts of the castle in brick, and he designed the beautiful gardens at the time. In a turn of events, the castle was put into the hands of Henry Hastings, who maintained the household of 77 servants. He also used the castle to imprison Mary, Queen of Scots, in 1569, after she was accused of plotting against Elizabeth I. But Henry spent most of his time at York, where he led the Council of the North. Alongside the tower, which was separated for fire safety, there is a roofed passageway that led on to a two-storey service range, with a pantry and a buttery. The castle's great hall was adapted from the medieval original hall that was built here. It was heated by a central fireplace, where the lord and his many important guests would have sat and eaten on a raised platform at the far end of the hall, overlooking the massive room that he would have decorated and proudly shown off his wealth. Following on from the great hall and into the great chamber, which was also two storeys high. It was originally with the parlour on ground level, but with a chamber above it, so that they were able to entertain their guests at the time. Incredibly, the chamber still features a richly carved fireplace with figures of shields and angels that are carved into the overmantel. This was from around the 1400s. Following north of the Great Chamber was a range of buildings that were used by the senior household staff. Walking inside the large chapel is really mind-blowing and beautiful to see. It was built of grey sandstone and is 18 by 6 metres wide. This chapel was a great size. It would have originally had an altar on a platform at the northern end and a choir on either side of the rooms. Three balconies, which were called closets, were arranged at the end of the chapel where the family would be able to attend mass in privacy. After the Reformation, the chapel was exposed of all of its decorations, and it's likely that the chapel was then furnished simply, but with basic functions, so that the household could still attend their prayers. This chapel remains and is still in use as a burial site by the modern Hastings family today. In 1642, the English Civil War broke out between Parliament and the supporters of Charles I. 
Henry Hastings ended up joining the Royalist cause before his death in 1643. But his eldest son, Ferdinando, inherited the family earldom and remained neutral during the conflict. Ashby was strategically well placed. It linked the Royalist territories in the north and the west of England, and it gave very easy access to the River Trent. The buildings in the nearby town of Ashby de la Zouche were pulled down to provide the all-important materials needed to reinforce and re-fortify the castle and its town. They managed to dig a tunnel and an Irish fort, which was a circular enclosure surrounded by a raised ditch or a moat that was helped to protect the castle. Henry had returned to the castle from Leicester, where another 600 royalist soldiers joined him, ready for battle along with Henry's already 60-man garrison. They carried out raids on parliamentary convoys to take control, but soon a plague broke out at the end of the year, and it forced the besiegers to retreat back to Leicester, and the garrison temporarily abandoned the castle buildings, and made home in the neighbouring park. Once the epidemic had passed, Parliament began to raid the town and Henry worked through Ferdinando to agree to get him to surrender the castle, but on good terms. Henry had just done that. He had achieved this in February of 1646 and it allowed the release of not only himself, but the garrison and all of their weapons. A few years later, in 1648, a royalist rebellion broke out in Kent, and there were fresh concerns about Henry Hastings and fears that he might reoccupy Ashby de la Zouche. A rival of the Hastings family was Lord Grey. He was put in charge of the castle in the August time, when he used the castle to hold royalist prisoners, including the Duke of Hamilton, James Hamilton. William Bainbrig was ordered to slight and deliberately damage the castle to make sure it was put beyond any military use. He carried out his orders and completely demolished one side of the Great Tower, as well as the Kitchen Tower, using tunnel warfare to break the foundations. The Hastings family suffered majorly, both financially and with their status with the result of the war, and Ferdinando was imprisoned for debt. The family moved to Donington Hall in North West, Leicestershire, and the castle fell further into decline, as did the town. On the walls of the Great Tower you can still see the battle wounds and the scars and pock marks from the impact of the musket balls that were launched to try and bring it down. Moving on into the 18th century to today, the Rawdon family inherited it. The castle became known as a famous location from Scottish historian and novelist Sir Walter Scott, who released a known novel named Ivanhoe, which featured a scene of a tournament at Ashby de la Zouche Castle. The novel at the time was immensely popular and drew in the crowds. Rawdon's agent, repaired and opened the castle ruins, with the hope to attract them to the nearby Ivanhoe Baths. But the castle was in such disrepair from the war that it was unstable and dangerous. So the castle was then placed into the guardianship of the Ministry of Works in 1932, when they were able to fund better and replace some of the stairwork, and they were able to also open up the surrounding grounds to visitors for a price. Fast forwarding it to now, it's managed and carefully 
cared by by the English heritage as a popular tourist attraction and amazingly we're able to explore here at our own leisure. My absolute favourite part of visiting here was seeing Lord Hastings Tower. It was built in the 1470s and was a complete house, full of its own kitchens, guard robes, bed chambers and public apartments. This tower really did have it all. The windows grow in scale and grandeur on each of the four floors, reflecting the importance of the floors within. A basement and a kitchen, both vaulted in stone and two luxuriously appointed apartments above. Right at the bottom of the tower there is a small entrance door. This has a panel carved with Lord Hastings arms, which if you look around at the other parts of the castle, you'll notice the arms there too. Attached to the main body of the tower is a turret of seven floors. It was built from finely cut stone and its long and intimidating scale was intended to impress the outsiders and people from afar. It's more than likely that Lord Hastings would have occupied this tower when he was visiting Ashby with only the important people of his followers. But when the entire household came here, all of the buildings of the castle would have been packed and occupied. The stone vaults of the tower kitchen helped make the building fireproof. It was extremely effective and it just looks incredible. An inventory was taken in 1596 and it showed that there were many valuable assets and household goods that were kept here. You can only imagine how incredible this tower would have been in its heyday. And thankfully you get the opportunity to climb the steep and uneven 98 steps. But you do get a beautiful overview of the castle's exterior and the surrounding countryside. The modern town of Ashby de la Zouche is but a stone's throw down the road from the entrance of the castle ruins. The castle comprises of two large towers and buildings that are arranged around a court, with formal gardens to the south, which you'll be able to see from Breckham later on. Lord Hastings intended that his castle would have had four imposing towers and enclosed by the interior buildings, with a curtain wall to a typical design. But sadly, only the two towers were only ever completed by the time of his death. The formal gardens of the site were the more private parts of the castle, and it would have been overlooked by the chambers of the Great Tower. The surviving earthworks that we see today were more than likely created in 1530s, but the garden was definitely altered much later on. The gardens were divided into sections, each planted and decorated in a different way, perhaps with a theme. The gardens were really unique, but this was also a reflection of the Hastings family and their awareness of the new European fashions of the time. The point of the gardens and the park at Ashby were to impress its visitors. It was a place for Lord Hastings to really show off, but it was also a place for leisure, especially hunting. Two brick towers still survive, one which we wonder to now, but they were more than likely built in 1530 by George Hastings. They were still quite sizeable and were once richly decorated and they gave amazing views over the gardens and the fish ponds as well as the deer park beyond. So I hope we've given some insight into this incredible castle ruin that Ashby de la Zouche actually is, and what an interesting visit we think you'll have. I'll give you some information on the site that might be useful if you fancy a visit. It is wheelchair accessible, but it's limited to the grounds. You'll be able to visit the English Heritage Shop where you can pick up an audio guide for free, and there is also a toilet on site. We brought a picnic that we sat on the benches to enjoy, as it's a perfect stop off, 
and dogs are allowed on the site with leads. There actually isn't free parking on the site, but a two minute walk away you can park in the local car park for around 50p an hour. This was at the time of visiting in April of 2023, so just have a look on Google if you need up to date prices and routes. If you've enjoyed the video, please hit that like button, click the subscribe button and share the video out. And also why not consider joining our channel using the join link or our Patreon if you fancy supporting the channel. We want to say a massive thank you to each and every one of you for watching and a big thank you to our channel members and to our Patreons. We'll see you on the next one. Till next time. Thank you.